Raw. Hello, I'm Hans Christoph Hobum. I'm professor for library information science. I have worked on the development of fictional prose in the 17th and 18th century, and I will try to give you some insight to this. Storytelling in family. We have those cubes, story cubes. You see, it is not a normal dice with numbers, but with pictures. And uh, you can take those cubes with you and uh, you throw them on the table and let your partner begin with a story. You have to tell a tiny bit of a story about this picture. So what do you tell? What do you say now? What is happening with your feet when you were in the holidays and you were marching on the, on the beach? And then finally, yeah, perhaps you found uh, some uh, interesting uh, animal and this animal was biting your feet or something like this. And uh, um, then you found uh, an apple and uh, this apple could be used to uh, yeah, help your bleeding feet or so. I don't know if it is really a story. <laughs> so you have to combine those dice dices and uh, you have your story when you have combined all the dices finally. This is one of the possible rules. But you can say also, uh, this dice is your turn, the next dice is the turn of someone else in the round, and the next one has to continue your story. So this is called sort of collaborative uh, story. And uh, yeah, for the next round you find a new story. After the beach party, you go away with a plane. Or you find another country. <laughs> <laughs> Some, some game, not dice, but uh, yeah, the story of the playing cards. And one of the stories I combine with playing cards is <coughs> that when the French Revolution found the playing cards in the aristocratic houses, they had uh, no sense with it and uh, they made out of playing cards the first library cards because on the same time they throw out the, b the books from the library, from the aristocratic houses. So this is my story too. This uh, serendipitical discovery stories of playing cards. As we all know, humans are interwoven in stories. Even every human object belongs to a story. So if you see a dice like this, you know where it comes from and what it is and what you have done with it and so on. And uh, the production of it has also a sort of a story, a history at least. And uh, finally one can say uh, that um, humans only differentiate between the meaning of things and the time-related embedding of the things, so that there the story comes from. Uh, the phenomenologists say that uh, um, humans um, have two sorts of thinking, which is one is the paradigm thinking and the other is a narrative sense making. So only those two general um, perspectives uh, we have. And uh, finally we can say that stories enable identities. Identities as a person, individual, or for the communities. So if you don't have a story, you, you, are, you don't have your biography and you don't have your identity as organization or even nation. Yeah? Um, but uh, stories are mainly oral. Uh, they belong to orality. And uh, they have mainly this characteristic that they are told between people directly. And um, with the advent of writing, things change. When we have literacy, we can talk also about orality in a narrower sense. Writing is seen as a um, liberation of memory, but also, as Platon says, it uh, could be a destruction of memory, or loss of memory. Um, and with the advent of mass media, and even social media, uh, we might have another level of orality and that I think we, will, we are talking about in this MOOC.
the discovery of the concept of implicit knowledge versus uh, explicit knowledge, which is uh, combined to Michael Polanyi, who talked about tacit knowledge of humans, uh, leads to a rediscovery of the person as a medium for the transfer of knowledge in a group or in an organization. So in recent time, with knowledge management, we are talking again from about uh, storytelling and stories as a medium for knowledge and even wisdom. I called it once in a uh, text, the wisdom of the text. And uh, we are now um, seeing a sort of a turn um, that uh, storytelling is uh, more and more seen as an instrument for knowledge management, for oral history, for instance in archival science, and with the, the concept of the living libraries, that is the talking books, persons as books you find in uh, libraries. Uh, that's why we are sitting here in a library, because some people in the library science says, say that uh, libraries are houses of stories. So when you see the stacks, you see a lot of stories, paradigmatic stories, but also narrative sense-making uh, stories. So that's a bit the general overview of what I, I'm talking about. Uh, what is the characteristics of uh, oral narrative? Yes, let's start with the oral narrative. Um, normally they don't have a real plot. That sounds a bit astonishing, but normally they don't have a tension line. They don't have a climax and then a happy end. No, that is not the main characteristic of oral, traditional, very old uh, narrative and storytelling. Um, they, have, they don't have the peripetia and they don't have a happy or tragic ending normally. They are mostly serial and can be told in portions. I will come to some examples later. Um, oral storytelling needs dramatization and have some mnemonic uh, memory elements like rhythm, rhymes and uh, dramatization also uh, means that uh, the auditorium, the audience, is uh, involved in the talking. Um, so the, the early um, talking, um, telling of stories of fairy tales, for instance in Brittany, uh, they discovered that the audience knew at, at what time they had to, for instance, to clap their hands. At the beginning, they, like we say in Germany, seid ihr alle da, was Kasperle Theater, in, in other, in the Celtic uh, area, they had, at the beginning, they had to clap the ends. And uh, at the end, there are several other uh, reads uh, the audience has to fulfill, so to say that the uh, story has an end. And as we say it in English, uh, and they lived happily ever after. And the audience joins this, and they lived happily ever after. So the listeners are involved directly. That is a main characteristic of, of very early storytelling. And at the beginning, there is no real distinction between history and story. For instance, Herodot or Homer, they both talk about gods, they both talk about the origins of the Greek uh, society, and they give the identity to this uh, culture, finally. So the, you can't really differentiate uh, between those. And if you look at the, the story itself, for, uh, for instance, uh, the Odyssey, it doesn't have in itself a climax and a, sta and a tension line. You say there are several stories combined together and you can tell, you can sing the Odyssey at different uh, portions. You can start in the middle, you can start there and, and the audience knows it. Finally, when literacy comes, so when write writing comes, we can begin to differentiate uh, those two genres. So with Platon and Aristoteles, the first uh, poetic theories uh, come into being and they first draw the line between history and fiction. So that is sort of uh, beginning. So um, yeah, we know some of the big narratives in our uh, Western world finally, but in nearly every culture you find something. Um, there are some of the very big uh, stories of the culture, the identity of the culture. Like for instance in Germany we have the Song of the Nibelung. And 
already with the, the title of this epic, uh, you see that it is sung. It is a chanson, if you want to. They have to sing it. Yeah? Um, it is only late in the medieval ages, with the advent of big scriptoria in monasteria, in uh, monasteries, and finally with the invention of the print, that the mnemonic uh, structures of fictional texts are lost. So you see it also when you come from the manuscripts to the printing. The first printing, you can't uh, decide if it is a manuscript or, or a printing because they imitate the print, they're the manuscripts. So it is the same coming from orality to literacy or fictionality. You still have these um, characteristics and elements of the oral diction, the oral situation of reception, the singing, for instance. So it is rather late um, in the, for instance, in the Renaissance in the, the Western world, we see the coming of some uh, other kind of stories. Uh, the first stories we can um, see in our perspective of uh, our storytelling, it is, for instance, Boccaccio's Dear Cameroon. And there you still see the serial characteristic of uh, the storytelling. You see there are 100 stories told by some group of people and uh, something happening with the audience also. But um, it is 14th century, for instance. And uh, only at the beginning of the 17th century we find the first novels in our sense. For instance, uh, this one here. You see it, Don Quixote. It is one of uh, many uh, historians or many um, historians of literature say it is one of the first novels in, in our culture. And if you look at it, it is still similar to the old culture, the old serial telling, the old uh, interconnected small parts of stories. And at the beginning of the 18th century, uh, we find uh, the first translation of the Arabic Arabian uh, Nights, one thousand and one nights, you know, which you have there. You have still this serial uh, part of telling, and finally you even have this ironic disruption that uh, storytelling saves life. I don't know if you, s you remember the story of the Arabian Nights. And this is in the 18th century that we can begin to think about fiction at a different level as, uh, as it has been done by Aristotle and, and Plato. And uh, there, we, in mainly in the 18th century and in, uh, with the beginning of the Enlightenment, we see that um, we have a fictional prose which is not oral anymore, it, which needs the book. So the fictional prose, the fictional storytelling begins to be combined to the individual, the person. You see pictures of uh, um, aristocratic ladies uh, very in, the, in their calm, reading a book, reading a, a story, reading some uh, fictional prose. So it is really beginning to be a matter of individual person, of personality. And you see, when we, when we say that um, the fictional prose has its start as Renaissance, you see, even in the Enlightenment and the 18th century, you see it is more combined to the uh, Renaissance of uh, the person and the individual and the, the possibility to say I. So, in fact, it has a democratic uh, tendency. And that's why uh, we sometimes can combine uh, novels with the Enlightenment and uh, further on uh, with the French Revolution, for instance. Without these new media, like uh, fictional prose, the novels, uh, we wouldn't have French Revolution because the wisdom and the knowledge which is integrated in the text can be distributed at a, in a more individualistic way so that people like this aristocratic ladies, or more the bourgeois ladies, can learn about the new values uh, of uh, yeah, um, the Enlightenment. This is uh, things, something that uh, Roland Barthes was talking about, the plaisir du text, that uh, in the text there's uh, something happening, uh, not only the storyline, but there is sort of um, yeah, transfer of knowledge, finally. After the French Revolution, 
uh, we still have um, the novel, and the novel is, of course, widespread. In the 19th century, we see the advent of uh, mechanical industrial printing press, so distribution of new media in a very, very large uh, form. So all these new technologies of mass production, and we can see it in a very general way, uh, today we see other new technologies of mass production. It's not only printing press. So this mass production of text and stories, together with spreading literacy and widely readable reception, in a very general uh, way, um, reception technologies like radio, for instance, in the 20th century, uh, these um, let us see a um, change in mainly in terms of quantity of the audience. And in the very strict sense, here we find really the mass media have a democratizing um, effect. More stories can be received uh, or in nowadays even produced by more people. That is, the story in itself is not only any more the main story, the big history, the big story of people or the big story in the autobiographical sense of one person, but several stories, very, very broad uh, concept of stories begin to appear in the 19th century. Um, that is a bit what Chris Anderson uh, describes as the long tail in the web 2.0. .0. And we can see the long tail already in the 19th century when the printing and the uh, mass production uh, technologies of texts appear. But in fact, it concerned fictional production already in the 19th century. So it's not only uh, the Web 2.0. Um, we see in the uh, 19th century that uh, hegemonial power try to um, delimit this democratizing effect of stories, finally. For instance, uh, by canalizing the mass production, by um, measures of censorship or the strict controls of libraries, for instance. And we see, for instance, the proscription of uh, the novels in the very general sense in the 19th century. At least uh, sometimes they, have, they, they are inventing uh, libraries for the uh, education of the poor people. So they have to canalize uh, the stories uh, and to choose the stories the poor people can read. As new forms of orality arise, more personal stories can be distributed and heard. With a paperback, for instance, also the distribution of very different kinds of stories begin. And technology and digitization gives us now the possibility to even share more stories of our lives, as does Facebook with its uh, element called in German Chronik. So you see your own life in the Facebook pages and you're telling your life with a new technology. And you tell perhaps some stories, as I said in the beginning, you tell stories of your objects you discover and you show your pictures what you're doing and you tell your stories. You are interwoven in those stories, with your show. In the 20th century, finally, we, f we f see that um, <coughs> the story, like uh, the mimesis in the arts, is uh, sort of destroyed. Think of the uh, novelists of the so-called Nouveau Roman. They, have, uh, they, are, they are filling books and books with the description of one, one second or one minute. Uh, so very, very uh, storyless sort of novels. This only changed in the last decennies of uh, the 20th century with some nouveau, nouveau roman. For instance, uh, Jean-Philippe Toussaint, La Salle de Bain, was one of the first who rediscovered uh, the story. He's still sitting the, in his bath uh, for a long time and uh, nothing happens really, but uh, there's the beginning of the story. And we find some other new um, representatives of, of new uh, stories like Michel Houellebecq. Uh, who is talk, telling a story, but a, a quite different, a differentiated uh, um, way. So, um, in philosophy, under the impression of the phenomenologists like Husserl and Merleau-Ponty, uh, 
the ontological foundation of humans by stories uh, begin to be recognized only in the 1950s. So we see that at the second half of the 20th century, we, s we have a new understanding of stories as being integrated in the human personality. And it is only um, during the 70s that we experience a turn, a general turn, in the, like several other turns we experience in social sciences, for instance. In history, we um, experience the turn in the historiography or the methodology of history, and there we discover oral history, that is, uh, interviewing uh, contemporary witnesses, Zeitzeugen, as they're called in German, as a new form of historiography. So we find here the rediscovery of the history in the storytelling. And we find um, what they call the narrative psychology in other uh, disciplines. Uh, like in management, uh, we rediscover storytelling for uh, knowledge management. And in information science, me being information scientist, uh, information science begins to be interested in the method and the concepts of um, storytelling. Um, in distinguishing explicit, inform explicit information and implicit knowledge. Um, and this only happens in the 90s, finally. So you see the story of storytelling at this point. And together with historiography, the archival science, which belongs to the information sciences, is now interested in documenting oral history in stories. So we are videotaping the last survivors of the, of the uh, Auschwitz and so on. And in library science, as I said before, um, and in library management, we are now talking of libraries as house of stories and develop the idea of living libraries with humans as talking books. Meet your living book and talk and hear his or her story. Okay, thank you. <laughs>